Okay, so we are back to our, our normal format, right? Uh, thanks everybody for coming out on Saturday for our, our workshop. I think from the uh, feedback I've been getting so far is that that was worthwhile. Um, hopefully you agree. If not, uh, I will point you in the direction of the survey I emailed out, okay? Um, so you should have gotten an email from me sometime Saturday afternoon with just some really quick questions. It did, I don't know, those of you that did the survey, did it take any longer than like three minutes or if that long even? No? It's, it's not that long and involved of a survey, okay? Uh, I really just want to give you guys a f uh, an opportunity to get give some feedback, uh, especially if, uh, I know sometimes the group think can overtake and the fact that everybody's like, this is great, this is great, and, and voices of dissent of like, this really didn't help me uh, can get crowded out. And so I want to give you a, an opportunity to, it's, it's anonymous or as anonymous as a Google survey can be, basically. I'm not going to use the cookies and backtrack and figure out who you are basically from the survey. So I'll, 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 I'll give you my promise in that regard basically. Um, but use the link, uh, visit that and uh, check on it uh, real quick, okay? Um, I don't know, uh, did anybody want to offer public comments to the class as far as their experience? Oh, Moth, cool. What now? Nobody has anything they want to say publicly? Yes, Daniel. Is Max supposed to have saving disabled? Is Max? Yes, this trial not started. I'm not sure. Okay, we need to contact IT about that. We're not uh, doing Max today. We'll be doing Ableton today, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, it should be, well, maybe check that on a few other machines at the end of class because we, we want to use, we're going to be using Max on Wednesday, okay? <laughs> No one? What? Uh, did you leave with a better sense of what live can do? Okay. Yes. Okay. Was it good to have that kind of intense hands on introduction all at once rather than doing it dribs and drabs over two or three weeks? Yes. Okay. Um, I, that, that's one of my key questions in the survey is like, should, is this, was this worthwhile enough that I should try to repeat this? next year or in the future when I do computer music if we're covering Ableton Live. Yeah. yeah especially coming from other DAWs, like the layout of Ableton is just different. It yeah. just operates in a different way. So like getting a really fast, quick crash course in the basics of how audio is routed through it and mm -hmm. then learning more detailed things afterwards. Yeah, where things are, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. So if you're exactly the option, start doing like a little bit Monday, a little bit Wednesday, and yeah. maybe you're going to have to yeah. Yeah. Okay. And we'll see going forward if it really works. <laughs> We're two days out, so we'll see two weeks, two months out whether you retain. Yeah. Solomon. Um, it was really helpful to see like a huge number of features all at once. Like, yeah. The stuff I can do and put them all together. Mm -hmm. um, I kept getting the feeling of hey, I want five more minutes to work on this thing we just learned about, but we've yeah. already moved on to another thing. I felt like I missed half of what happened that day simply because I was caught up trying to do what we had just done and we already moved on. So yeah. The pacing was way, way too fast. Okay. <laughs> okay. Did anybody else? That was one of my questions on the survey. Is like, well, was it just right? Was it too fast? Was it way too fast? Was it a little too fast? So uh, please give me that feedback as well. Um, we will re- cap some of those things uh, today and in the future. Uh, I'll just say this, the sampler stuff was stuff I wanted to get to in week six, basically, and now you guys have already been introduced to it. Uh, hopefully that means that we can go deeper in week six rather than just giving you a surface level, look, drag some samples and now you can trigger them, basically. Let's talk about like what kind of uh, processing you can do with those uh, samples once they're in your 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 impulse device in your sampler device. Uh, he did not cover the sampler device. So there's actually three different samplers in uh, built into Ableton that we'll, we'll touch on. Uh, we'll also look at other samples as we look at the other other tools that are out there. But yeah, I, I did get that sense as well that it's like, okay, we were moving on to the next thing and people were still just trying to settle in on the thing we had just covered, especially in the afternoon session. Yeah. Is that the general sense? Okay. Okay. Um, 
Cool. Well, again, do collect the survey. Uh, I, I've got kind of, I think it was up to like eight people now, uh, and we want, I want to get, you know, past 50, 60, 70 percent of you responding so that I feel good about the results, okay? Uh, and again, I, as, I, I don't, I don't need to know who said what. I just want to get a sense of the group, basically, of what you guys felt about the workshop and whether it's um, some, something worthwhile, something we should continue doing. The reading responses, yes. Uh, we've had some issues with these over the weekend. Uh, some of you were able to do the reading responses on Blackboard, uh, which is great. I wish I could read them because it's broken for me. So uh, all, of, all of you that have submitted via Blackboard, I'm, it's, it looks like they're there. I can see that you've submitted via Blackboard, but I can't actually access your responses on Blackboard. Uh, so, uh, I've gotten some update from IT. IT said that they, they're in communication with uh, Blackboard, the company, because whether you realize it or not, it's a third-party company that has this, uh, this uh, service, basically, that we use, Blackboard, for content management. Um, they're actually doing a server reset this evening at 2 a.m., uh, when hopefully not many people are on. Uh, so they're going to do a quick reset to see if that solves the bug. That's, I guess, the, the equivalent of turning off and turning back on your machine, basically. They're going to do that with Blackboard to see if that resets it. Um, if that does not work, we're going to have to find another option because obviously I can't have you guys submitting reading responses and not able to check them because, uh, as I talked about on Friday, that's my method of checking that you're doing the reading, basically. Okay, um, And I'm, 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 I'm doing it in a new way this year where it's not so much... Uh, quizzing you on the content but asking you about the content basically so that it's more open-ended and as I said on Friday there's no right or wrong answer to the quiz questions it's just a matter of I want to get a sense of how uh, whether you're getting the material and hopefully that series of questions will work for us if I need to augment them or rearrange them I can do that later um, I have a couple ideas Matt had one idea that he email, emailed me about right we were saying like set it up as a discussion board where people can because one of the things you can do on Blackboard is have a discussion board where there's different threads um, and actually people can't read the thread until they've submitted to the thread so it prevents you from cribbing someone else's answers because you can't read any of the comments until you've actually submitted something to the thread yourself so that's one option that we could use. Um, the other thing I thought about, I've used these Google surveys related to the workshop, I could just use the Google surveys uh, and do it that way. I would need to add one more field for either your name or your 800 number, um, just so I know who did what. The, the main thing I'm looking for is, are you guys getting what you need to get out of the material, basically? Um, I don't know, do you guys have a sense of, would you prefer that it be a Google survey, or would you prefer that it be inside of Blackboard? I'm seeing Victoria's nodding her head for a Google survey versus, you'd, you'd rather not have to log on to Blackboard, is that what I'm hearing? Or you're just... Casey's like, Blackboard is what it is. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we, we log into it for other things. So. Yeah. Well, I'd have to post the link somewhere, although I guess I could tweet out the link so there it's, yeah, something like that. What now? No, it's not Blackboard. I just yeah. posting my answers for today. Ah, okay. Yeah, Christian. Uh, so we already submitted on Blackboard. Should we do, I'm just doing the email thing? It's there. Uh, I, I hope that I will get to it. Okay. Um, let's, let's put it this way. I will give you credit for submitting on Blackboard. It's just I can't see what you wrote, so I can't act on your feedback. <laughs> so the, the, the goal should be both. One, checking that you did the reading. That's your proof to me that you did the reading. But two, I would like to be able to act on the feedback. If, if five people say, I really didn't understand this from the reading, then that's obviously something I should cover in class. Yes, okay. That's, what that, that's the purpose of that last question of like, I didn't get this, basically, okay. Uh, looking for trends and that sort of stuff. Um, today, it seemed like those that emailed me, it was like, no, I'm, I'm good with this information because of the fact that we had the five-hour workshop and the, the reading just simply reinforced some of this stuff. Yes, that was kind of the sense I was getting from people. Did anybody have a different response that actually submitted on Blackboard? Or, yeah. So are we supposed to email those to you then? I w email was only a backup if you could not get to them on Blackboard. Right, because I didn't email to you because I saw in the last thing mm -hmm. how to discuss how we will collect these. I thought we were talking about how we're going to collect them. Like, so all right, yeah, that's, I'm, that's why I'm discussing today, like alternate plans. Because if this server reset at 2 a.m. doesn't work, I need to 
move and get something in place for Wednesday as an alternate. Do you want me to email those three minutes? Because I filled them out, but I didn't email them because I didn't. So wait, do, I didn't email my responses to you. Oh, yeah. Go ahead and email it to me. Yeah, I'm going to be flexible about the deadline today, okay? Yeah. The things like I got your email before, I read the book, so I emailed you instead. I'll just come back. Yeah, that's fine. And everybody that has, e everybody that has emailed me, I actually logged on the Blackboard and I checked complete for this this reading response. Okay, I did do that. Uh, it's just that I can't get to the those of you that the quiz is working. I can't get to your answers, which is frustrating because that's my that's my data feedback of like whether you're actually understanding the reading. Okay, but yes, you will get credit for completing it. Okay. Um, the main thing I wanted to check on is is there anybody that's like still lost at this point of like. What is this live program that we're using? I, I hope you're not at that point because you know we're going to be kind of moving on from there. Okay. Okay. Um, if there's nothing else, so I let's see. I'm going to wait and see if this server, server reset works overnight. If not, I might set up a Google survey for. Um, for Wednesday, if we might be in transition through this week trying to move to another platform if the server reset doesn't work. So I'm giving you a heads up about that. Um, I guess, I mean, one reason, I'll show you real quick. One of the nice things about the Google survey, so this is like the survey you guys did about the workshop, okay? I can click on responses and I can see like this, you know? This is useful information for me because if I can see that, yes, 71% of you want food at the workshop, okay? That's what made me say, okay, yes, we need to make sure we have food, okay? Um, okay, makes sense? Uh, if 80% if of you strongly disagree that the reading was helpful, well, then we need to talk about that, right? Makes sense? This is the kind of information I want. I think the way I've set up the reading responses in Blackboard is gonna give me that. If, it, if not, Google surveys I know will give me that information, so we might migrate to this platform, okay? So just be prepared for that, okay? Um, yeah, and I've got interesting data on the other ones as well. And I, you may or may not have seen this, but I know the one for the, the, the post-workshop survey I set up to actually give you a link to the results so you can actually see what people have submitted uh, once you've made your own submission to the survey, okay? Um, and I also can do things like close the survey, that sort of stuff. So it's a little less automatic when it's in Google rather than uh, Blackboard. Okay. Um, what else did I want to say? YouTube resources. So on uh, on Blackboard, I've actually you. I don't know. Has anybody dived into this folder over here that says YouTube resources? Okay. So there's a hiding over here. Okay. Uh, Hunter, your Davis Lab calendar is here now, okay. so there's a link so you can actually find out when this room is open. But right above that is a YouTube resources folder. Okay, that's where my recordings from class. That's the top thing. But then in addition to that, I've I've actually been trolling through YouTube looking for people that have good video channels with content related to our three pieces of our three tools. Okay, Ableton Live, Maximus Max, and um, uh, Eurorack Gear. Okay. So there are, there are, I mean, there's hours of content here related to our three different tools. So if you need extra, if you're, if you're the per kind of person that needs to see someone do it rather than talk about it, okay, this is your, uh, I don't know, place to go to find stuff basically, okay. I didn't put stuff here without watching a few, I, I can't claim to have watched all of the hours of footage that's linked here, but I've watched a few of the videos on each one of these feeds to make sure that this is good content for you to have, okay. So this is my curated list of YouTube content here, okay? Uh, you know, including Dude 837 and uh, some of which, some of the stuff comes from the actual source itself of the software. Others is third party stuff that people have uh, figured, that, that people have posted, okay? So in addition to our class recordings, it's not just class recordings here, it's other people's content on YouTube that I've found is useful for you to learn about this stuff, okay? Um, learn about these tools, okay? Make sense? So uh, feel free to browse this. I'm not necessarily going to assign specific videos out of here, but uh, if you're someone that wants more content to devour, if, if, if you're someone that 
words on a page doesn't speak to you as much as video of someone actually doing the thing, this is the place to go, okay? Make sense? Okay. Um, where are we going next? Okay. So our topic for today, uh, and my, my first open-ended question to you guys, uh, after spending five hours or four or five hours with Ableton Live on Saturday, is live a DAW or is it a performance instrument? Is it a tool for music production or is it something that you can use on stage? Uh, right answer, to Casey, yes, okay. What, what, what did you see that made it look like a, a, the DAWs you've seen before? Are you going to say something along those lines, Marcus, or are you going to say something different? No? What did you see in Ableton Live that made it look like a DAW? Daniel? Arrangement view, yeah. The arrangement view is pretty close to what you may have seen in other DAWs, right? What else? What are other elements does it have that are like other DAWs? Victoria? Audio effects, okay. JC? Yeah, there's a mixing interface. There's bus routing, okay. What else? How about just the idea that it's organized in tracks? Yes, okay. That's a kind of a, a concept that gets carried over to multiple DAWs. Anything else? Okay, what makes it more like a performance instrument, Nico? Okay. Oh yeah, the, the the quantization stuff is geared toward triggering things and having them line up on bar lines. Daniel. Okay. So connecting it with MIDI keyboards. Solomon. Heavy focus on sampling and manipulating samples, especially in live. Yeah, yeah. So sampling both things that you've imported ahead of the performance, but also sampling during performance and creating loops. Uh, we saw a little bit of that, right, with Joey, who was like recording into, recording from one track into another and then looping that new, that new recording, that new recorded track. Yeah, Solomon? Uh, customizing your MIDI interface. Yeah, yeah. Really simple. Yeah, very simple to customize how Ableton is interfacing with your hardware, okay? Uh, that's a positive. How could that be a negative in terms of multiple users and multiple people uh, using your setup or using live? Can you assume that you're, if you're using someone else's live set that it's mapped the same way that yours is? No, okay. So because it's flexible, when you go into a live set that's been created by someone else, you can't assume that this key is going to do that, basically, okay? I think maybe the one stable thing is the tab key is usually is used for going back and forth between arrange and session view. Okay, make sense. So make sure that you're you're aware, paying attention to how those mappings are occurring. Okay. Um, okay. So I wanted to do just a little bit today to make sure we've got a, a, a with live today to make sure we've got a grounding in some of the terminology and you know where some of the things are, and also I think. One of the things I can do is dive in a little more conceptually of what's happening in terms of these different elements because there's some conceptual things that are happening in live even in just a basic set, uh, set that will carry over conceptually to when we start working with Max to when we start working with the Eurorack hardware, okay? Um, so my first question for you guys, I, I want to do just a really simple live set where we play a chord and then we arpeggiate that chord because he was using the arpeggiation in one way. There's, uh, you can use it there's other things the arpeggiation tool can do, okay? So I want to highlight some of that. Um, my question is, do you need keyboards to do that, the MIDI keyboards, or are you going to just mouse in your mouse in your uh, your note input? How about this? If you if you feel if you're a piano person and you feel like you need the tactile of keys on the keyboard, uh, I'm not going to stop you from getting up and grabbing a keyboard, okay? At this point or at some point in, in the demo, okay? So we're going to launch into live. If you don't have live open, go ahead and launch it. Okay. Starting from scratch with just a, the, the normal blank session that pops up. Okay. Um, 
Okay, and everybody's comfortable now at this point with the session view and the arrangement view and the difference. I mean, when you see this, you should know this is arranged, even though it doesn't say arrangement at the top. Okay, it's the the things become horizontal at this point. Okay, that's I think the the basic visual thing. Okay, that that set that arrangement view has that's distinct from uh, session view, and you can even see these icons at the top. Okay. Right here, um, heck, that's even like what was on his shirt, right? The, the the horizontal lines versus the vertical lines. Okay, so it's ah, okay, starting to come together here. Okay, this iconography that they've adopted in terms of what uh, the session view and the arrangement view look like. Okay, so these act as switches if you click on them. If so, if you're someone that is reliant on your mouse clicking on various things, you can click here and switch between them. Um, I encourage you to learn, if, if you learn no other keystroke, learn the tab key to be able to switch between them, okay? Just like in, um, in Pro Tools, being able to qu quickly tab between the two views, okay? Um, I'm going to spend most of my time in session view today, okay? And I'm going to spend a lot of time in session view probably throughout the semester because for me, this is really where, let's see, of the two things that Live does, being a DAW, being a performance tool, I tend to like it for a, its performance tools, its performative aspect. So uh, if, uh, I guess, if my bias towards session view comes out in the way I'm teaching live, sorry, okay? If you want to push me toward using things in the arrange tool, uh, by all means. But I figure at this point, you guys have got a semester under your belt using thing, a lot of things that look like the arrange view. Uh, and so the session view is the new thing. Let's, I'm going to spend some time with that. Yeah, Daniel. Well, session view allows you to have a series of clips loaded and then interactively trigger them. You can't really do that in the arrange view, right? The arrange view can record the different triggerings and then you can delete and remap things, basically. I guess what I was asking is in session view, is there anything you can do that you can do in the arrange view? The triggering of clips, I think. I, well, you could do that with the hardware. You can't do that with visually on the screen. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So let's. Uh, we're going to be using a MIDI track today. Okay. Um, and it seems like most of you know about the info view down here in the lower left-hand corner. But this is kind of your floating uh, uh, piece of information about whatever you've got your 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 mouse cursor hovering over. So. I, especially here at the beginning, it's good to have this open. If it disappears on you, it's this little triangle in the lower left-hand corner, okay? Makes it go away and come back, basically, okay? So just so you know if it's not there because someone before you collapsed that view, okay? In addition to that, if you need help inside of the live environment or if you're still looking for uh, introduction to different elements, there is, under help, there is this help view. Everybody see that? Help view. When you click on that, a sidebar opens on the right-hand side. These are actually interactive tutorials that will walk you through elements of live. So even if after the uh, the five hours, or if you're someone that you, were, I, you had to leave kind of in, in the middle, right, ISIS, you can actually come here and view some of these interactive demos. They'll walk you through things, these lessons, okay? So I'm just trying to show you where there's resources for you to get more instruction inside of the live environment, okay? Um, let's see. So we spent some time with the browser, although I don't know that he, I mean, did you guys get a sit, get from either the workshop or the, uh, come on or the reading, right? This section over here is the browser, okay? Um, it's on the other side of the screen from where, right? In Pro Tools, we have kind of the, the, the clip uh, repository on the side. In Logic, we have the clip repository on the right-hand side. In Live, it's all on the left-hand side, and it's more than just uh, sound fragments and MIDI fragments. It's Everything that you want to be able to pull into your session is here in this integrated browser on the left-hand side, okay? Um, we're going to be using mainly uh, instruments, audio effects, and MIDI effects today, okay? But there's other things that you can uh, access here. In addition to the fact that you can actually add to your own uh, places, you might see down here at places, you've got different, you might have different options than I have, okay? 
And when you're on your own machine, you can add things to this. That was what he was showing you about adding, full, adding a folder. Okay. So if you're on your own machine and you've got a repository of samples, it's a good idea to add that folder to the browser. Um, or if you're on your own machine and you've got a repository of projects, you can actually add a folder of projects. So I've actually got projects that I was working on this summer all right here, and I can actually pull them up interactively. So the browser pulls in everything from clips to plugins to uh, projects to I don't know, samples. It's everything. Browser is all the content both at the micro level and the macro level, okay? Um, that's something that's pretty different from other DAWs out there, yes? Okay, uh, Pro Tools and Logic handle importing a session versus importing a clip very differently, okay? For live, it's kind of all integrated into one browser over on the left-hand side, okay? Make sense? Um, so what do we want to do? We want to pull in, we've got a MIDI track. Let's go ahead and create a clip on one of the MIDI tracks. How would I do that? Anybody remember from Saturday? Or the book? Yeah, double click, right? The book talks about the, the keystroke, right? You can, there's a shift Apple M will create a, a clip for you, okay? So if you're a keystroke person, but the ability to just simply double click is pretty handy. Okay, so double clicking creates the, the clip for you, okay? And then we've got the piano roll that we should be familiar with, yes, from other applications. The piano roll view comes up in other applications. Um, and we've got, let's see here. I, I want to point out one thing that I, I, th I found that some of you were getting kind of uh, confused by, right? In the actual clip slot, right, there's both the... Uh, the icon that represents accessing the clip, and then there is this play button on the side that is for triggering the clip, okay? Some of you were confused at the beginning where you, you were hitting play on it and nothing was happening, yes? Okay, and that's because the clip itself was not triggered to start, okay? So this little play icon on the left-hand side of the clip slot, okay, is what actually triggers that clip, that specific clip, okay? And when you have multiple clips, you can tell which one has been triggered by whether it's green at the time, okay? So right now, this clip is playing even though I have nothing in it, and I can see the progress bar. Does everybody have their clip with the progress bar going by here? Go ahead and click play at the top on the, the transport, right? Transport's the terminology we use for the play, stop, rewind functionality, okay? Record. Um, and go ahead and trigger the clip so that we've got the progress board going by here, okay? Um, let's go ahead and create, uh, let's create a chord here, okay? Uh, and now so I know we have different musical av abilities here in this room because we've got some people that are coming out of computer science, some people that are coming out of four semesters of music theory, so let's just make sure we don't gloss over this, okay? What's this, those of you that are music geeks, uh, and I say that with all sorts of love because I'm a music geek myself, uh, explain a chord really Succinctly, conceptually, for someone who has not had four semesters of music theory. Uh, All right, uh, yeah. Multiple notes played at the same time. Multiple notes played at the same time. Uh, no, uh, well, it's like an arpeggio that's played at the same time. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, we're getting into, yeah, what an arpeggio is basically. Okay, but multiple notes played at the same time. That's a good definition. Anything we want to add to that? Yeah. Yeah, usually three or more notes, right? Okay, because if we have two, then we're talking about an interval. Okay, okay, but that simultaneity, okay, is what we're talking about with a with a chord that's sounding. Okay, um, okay, where it gets confusing in music theory is sometimes the chord is implied by the harmony of the melody of that sort of stuff, right? Okay, but let's talk about just playing a chord simultaneously, okay? I want to create three notes here, and I'm going to create a pretty bland chord. You can pick whatever chord you want, okay? I'm just going to double click to create a C, okay? I'm going to add an E, and then I'm going to add a G, okay? And you can use the piano roll here to see what you've got here. So if, you, if you're if you someone who's uh, scared of music theory, okay, C, E, and G will give you a nice sounding major chord, okay? And I, I'm not hearing it yet, okay? But I've got this in place. 
Uh, I went ahead and double clicked and I'm extending it so it fills the whole bar. Okay, I'd encourage you to go ahead and do that as well. Whatever core you've selected. Everybody got that? Okay, once you've got that, okay, this clip now has some specific content in it, right? It'd be useful if we could actually look at this clip up here and through whatever notation is in this clip slot, know what content is in there, right? Okay. Uh, it, in other words, it'd be no useful to know what's in the clip without actually having to play the clip, so we can actually look at it and tell what it is. Right now, it's blank, right? It has no label on it, okay? So let's put a label on it. How do we relabel a clip? Okay, so you can right-click. There's an option to rename. But you'll also notice that there's a keystroke, right? Command R, okay? This is where uh, the, I was very intentional in calling it relabeling it or renaming it, okay? Because the keystroke is R for renaming, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and rename it. I'm going to call this C major. You might want to label it whatever chord you've got, okay? Or if you want to, okay? So now I know that I've got a C major chord in that slot, okay? All right? Labeling, get in the habit of labeling things because labeling things will help you know the differences between your slots before you even play them, right? Okay, make sense? It's like if you had a bunch of jars with different, uh, I don't know, food in them or spices in them, right? If they weren't labeled, you might not know what's, whether you're adding pepper or paprika or cumin to your, uh, I don't know, your dish, right? Okay, I don't know. Uh, let's, let's see. Pe pepper, and you can probably tell the difference between those, but uh, maybe cumin and cinnamon look so similar, right? They're both brown. Fine. You guys are lost here. Have you, have you ever cooked for yourself? Okay. Okay. There are spices that look similar, right? And based on the label on the bottle, right, you know which one to add. Okay. Can we agree on that? Okay. Okay. This is the equivalent. This is the equivalent of that. Okay. I now know I have a C major in that slot. Okay. So I want to actually hear this sounding. I need something that's going to take this information. And so, I mean, what's happening here, I've got three MIDI notes, okay? They are being sent out, but nothing is converting them into sound for me, right? I can't listen to MIDI notes directly. I need to, something that's actually going to turn them into sound, okay? Um, so conceptually, what we're wanting to do here, okay, we want to take the MIDI information, this is why I highlighted the difference between MIDI and audio on Friday, right? I want to take the MIDI information that's in this clip and I want to turn it into audio sound that I can hear, okay? And I need an Ableton instrument to do that, or AKA a synth, okay? You might hear me talk, just use synth as a shorthand, okay? Or a soft synth, software synth, okay? That's what the terminology we were using in when we did this in Logic, right, okay? Ableton calls these instruments, okay? So. Flipping back to live, okay, we need to add a, a synth to this. How would I do that? We used operator the other day. We're going to use operator again, yes? So, Daniel, yeah? Yeah, well, we want to, I want to use the operator again. So, in the browser, I need to get to the instrument tab and I want the operator instrument and if I drag this down here now what happens? Everybody see that icon? It's a little small on my screen. Oh, I just did something there. Yeah, everybody see that? What, what's that universal symbol for with a circle with a line through it? What does that mean? No, I can't do that, right? Okay, so okay, I can't just drag it down here where the piano roll is. Okay, I need to actually insert it on the track, and that's where double-clicking at the head, right, at the top of the track, dragging it down here, okay, I now have an operator that's playing this lovely chord. You all should have a chord now, too, okay? Okay? And if, you're, if, you're, if your chord is less lovely than your neighbor's, okay, you can adjust the MIDI clip to, to get uh, the harmony right, okay? But we should have some chords playing around the room here. Okay. So again, what we're doing in effect is taking the MIDI data in the clip and turning it into sound so we can hear it. Okay. I want to make sure we're clear on that conceptually.
Okay. So, uh, do me a favor, because operator actually has multiple oscillators in it. I'm going to, on mine, I'm going to disable B, C, and D, so I'm just hearing one oscillator. Okay. So, all I did there was, if, if, if the letters are highlighted, they're on. If they're gray, they're off. Okay. So, that we're just listening to one oscillator. Okay. And the default on mine should be a sine wave. Okay, lovely. Okay, I believe that's the default on operator. Okay. Okay. Whoop, I didn't want to do that. I want to zoom out. Okay. So I've got a C major. What if I want to create an X, another clip that's C minor? Well, how would I how would I go about creating a second clip? What's maybe a, a, a fast way to do that? Okay, I can copy and paste. So I can actually click on this clip. I can copy it and paste it to the next slot. In addition, there's a there's a short uh, shortcut for that called duplicate. Okay, so if I if you uh, control click again, you'll notice there's a duplicate option in this menu. Okay. Uh, or the keystroke is Command D. Okay, it's going to create a second slot. If I double click this now, okay, notice. I, I want to draw your attention to this. It looks like the same clip, right? Because it's the same chord, right? I'll turn this down just a little bit. Okay, but how can I tell this is not the clip that's actually playing? What are some visual cues that Live is giving me, Christian? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, everybody see this? This is where the trigger comes in handy, right? This is not green, okay? So I know this is not the clip that's playing, okay? What are some other visual cues that you see on the screen here? There's one other one. Yeah, down here in the piano roll, that's a zoomed in a little too far, okay? I don't have that line going across showing me that I'm playing this clip, okay? So... Be aware when you ha start having multiple clips in your tracks, make sure you know whether you're editing the one that's actually playing or whether you're uh, editing a duplicate, okay? I'm gonna change this to a C minor chord, okay? Okay, or you can feel free to alter your chord in any way you like, okay? Uh, and once I go back to this, I should be able to, okay, now the label is wrong, right? Okay, they're both still labeled C major. What do I do to, to fix that? Command R, right? Okay, I'm going to change this to C minor so I know that this is a C minor chord. And now I can click the trigger and right on the bar it switches to C minor. Okay, lovely. We've just, we've, we're working on our music composition here, okay? Two chords, that's all you need, right? Okay. What, three? Okay, yeah. Most pop music, right? Okay, you can you can you can compose a lot of pop music with three chords. Okay, okay. So we've got two chords, and we can now switch between them. Okay, both of which are MIDI information that's being rendered into sound by our operator instrument. Okay. Uh, let's see. We've covered editing. We've covered triggering them, renaming, duplicating clips. Okay. So there's a lot of skills that we're uh, plugging into, and I'm trying to make sure I'm using the proper terminology. Uh, let's hopefully you guys start to work on using the proper terminology for these things so we can communicate better, right? Because if you start calling it one thing and I'm calling it something different, it's going to make it harder for us to understand what's going on, okay? Uh, so he showed us the, well, let's see, maybe I'll introduce the arpeggiator again first before I get to the tempo controls, okay? So I want to work with a MIDI effect. Okay, the arpeggiator is a MIDI effect. So back to my slides here, okay. It's important to understand that when you're working with a MIDI effect, okay, you are processing the MIDI. You are changing the MIDI information before it gets to the synth, okay. You're not altering the sound because the sound is still being handled by the, the instrument, okay. But the MIDI information before it gets the instrument is being altered. That's what the arpeggiator was doing. That's what he was doing with the arpeggiator. Okay, he was running the arpeggiator on one note. Okay, which leads to a certain type of behavior. 
Let's now run the arpeggiator on a chord that's being played simultaneously and see what it does. So go ahead and under MIDI effects, find the arpeggiator and drag it down to your right before your operator. If you try to move it over here, you'll notice that it's it's not going to work because it says drop audio effects. You have to actually put it before the operator because it's going to work on the MIDI data. Ah. Okay. So back to your Christian, what, what's happening now? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's so for, for musicians, this terminology is second nature, right? Those of you that have not been through four semesters of theory, right? What's happening is we are taking the chord, which in the original clip is being told to sound simultaneously, right? But what the arpeggiator does is it breaks it apart, okay? And it moves through the steps of the chord, okay? The intervals of the chord automatically, okay? Just to confirm for yourself, if you double click on the clip, you see nothing happened to the MIDI data here, right? It's just simply a block chord. But the arpeggiator takes care of rolling through the, the chord, okay? Uh, it is arpeggiating, okay? So there's, it's, it's a borrowed Italian term, arpeggio, there's a verb form, arpeggiating, okay? Uh, there's the noun form, which is this uh, MIDI effect that we're running, the arpeggiator, okay? Makes sense? So this concept of arpeggiating through a chord, okay? Why would this be useful? Why would we want to have something roll through the chord for us without having to actually notate it all out? Yeah. Yeah, I don't have to bother with notating out the individual elements of the chord, okay? And typing them into the MIDI clip. The arpeggiator can take care of it for me, okay? An arpeggiator is a very common electronic music device that's going to show up in multiple places in multiple ways, okay? So that I want I didn't want to blow past that conceptually what that is doing. In live it is a MIDI effect, okay? Make sense? Okay, so we're going to see arpeggiators in other contexts. In fact, the Euro rack that we have has an arpeggiator on it. Okay, so it can it can work that way as well. Okay, um, let's see here. La, 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 la. Okay, so it's playing at the tempo. This is why I wanted to introduce the arpeggiator before I got to the tempo controls. Okay, oh, not that. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Okay, so you may notice that he was messing around with the. Uh, the actual BPM number, the beats per minute number, okay? 120 is 120 beats per minute or 2 beats per second, okay, if you divide it by 60. Um, that's why we're... Okay, you feel that 120 BPM? Okay, we ha can change a couple things. We can actually change the meter here. So 4-4 four, four is the default, but there's no reason I can't have 5-4. Okay, which is going to, uh, let's see, oh, that's not going to affect anything because my clip is still notated in 4-4, okay? So there's the clip meter, but then there's also the global meter as well, okay? So pay, you have to pay attention to that. The, the one feature I wanted to show here, there's this button that's called tap, okay? What do you think we can do with the tap button? Yeah. Yeah, we can tap in a tempo here, okay? So if you know you want it to be slower and you're feeling a tempo in your head, but you don't know if it's 62 or 68, okay, you can just simply go. I'm just tabbing with the mouse. Make sense? Okay, so that's a handy feature to have. There's also this other button here, which I don't think we have time to get into, and I actually have not experimented with this link button. Has anybody heard about this and know what this does? Okay. Uh, this is a button to actually link multiple computers that are running Ableton Live together so that they're all using the same clock. Yes, so you could actually collaborate with multiple people running live on their computers and have it all sync up very nicely, okay? That's what Link does, okay? Uh, I have not had time to troubleshoot that, and I'm on a Wi-Fi, and you guys are wired, so I don't think it would work in this room, but if people want to experiment with that, that's a handy little collaboration tool there, okay? Um... Let's see. So we've talked about the instrument. We've talked about the MIDI effects. 
Can let's talk. Can go ahead. Uh, so you can also, there's apps you can download on your phone. Yep. That you can link to it. Yeah, there's apps for your phone that you can link to Ableton Live that they all auto magically sync up together, okay? So, I want mine to go a little faster, okay? I'm still in minor. Let me go back to major, okay? Uh, let's see here. Okay, so let's talk about an audio effect. Okay, and I know I'm getting toward the end of my time here, okay? Uh, let's see. I want to add an audio effect to this. So again, back to the browser, you're going to see that there's a tab called Audio Effects. Uh, and let's go ahead and use one of the ones that he used on Saturday, Audio, audio Filter. Okay? Now, let's see. You should be able to see, based on this graph, what kind of filter is this? Does anybody know? How, maybe I should back up. How do I read this graph? What are, what's, what's being represented on the x-axis versus the y-axis? Yeah, frequency on the x-axis. Okay, that's why it says 100, 1k, 10k. Okay, this is the range of hearing here. Okay, and then what's on the y-axis? Amplitude. Okay, how loud it is. Okay. Now, right now, we're not going to hear very much effect on this. Why? Anybody know? It actually has something to do with what we did back here. What now? What's going on right here in my operator instrument? It's just a sine wave, which a sine wave is what in terms of frequency? It's the most basic. It is a single frequency, right? Okay. So if I have a single frequency going to a filter that is meant to shape multiple frequencies, am I going to hear much effect between? Right. You might think that your filter is broken at this point, right? But it's because there's only one frequency being triggered at a time. Okay. And therefore, Nothing is happening up in the 1K to 10K range. Therefore, you're not going to hear these frequencies be attenuated. Okay? So let's fix that. Go back over to your operator. And if you see where it says SIN, which they've dropped the E off of sine, okay, we'll forgive them that. Okay? And scroll up and find a SAW 64. Okay? It's going to change the timbre, right? But it's changing the timbre because we've got multiple frequencies being triggered now in a an arrangement here. Okay, whoop. And if I go back to my filter now and start moving it. Okay. Make sense? Okay. So what I wanted to point out here, uh, I'm gonna zoom out here. Okay. Your audio effects are dependent on both the input and the output, okay? So when the out when the input is of a certain type, you might not hear the effect of it on the output side, okay? Uh, we've got this audio effect running uh, in a fashion that is in line, okay? So we've got our input, the effect, and then we get the affected output, okay? That's how this filter is operating, okay? Um, we are going to need to take some time probably either Wednesday or, or next week to talk about the difference between inline and sidechain configurations. That was what he was talking about when he was talking about sends and receives and that sort of stuff. I want to make sure you guys are clear on how we can use effects both as inline audio effects and sidechain audio effects because it does... It does alter the way we hear the output. I was trying to not use the word effect there. Did anybody catch that? Okay, it's, okay. so uh, that's all I have time for here, basically. But uh, hopefully slowing down and talking a little about the concepts here, okay, is helpful, okay? Your reading for Wednesday ha relates to Max for Live and also what Max does. So we're going to be cracking open the Max environment. Not, I'm going to wait and do actual Max for Live stuff a little bit later. I want to look at Max apart from Live before we actually look at it inside of Live on uh, on a future date. Okay. Um, as you're packing up, just to remind you, let's see here. 
uh, dates, right? So I mentioned on Friday, yes, tomorrow evening, Daryl Holtz is going to be here. Okay, so if you haven't seen the announcement for this, uh, he's head of the EA uh, studio down in Maitland. Okay, so it's, it's uh, I believe, 6 p.m. up in the Stetson room. There is a link online to RSVP so they order enough dessert. I don't know, because it's open to the public to come to this thing. Uh, and make sure you're doing the reading for Wednesday. I will send out some sort of email if I try to do an alternate thing for the uh, reading responses, okay? Um, keep in mind, these do get recorded and posted on YouTube, so if you lose track of what I say here at the end of class, that's one option for you is to kind of, uh, what did he say I'm supposed to do for Wednesday? Is log on to YouTube and uh, find it out there, okay? I'll see you all on Wednesday. Bye.